Yes, good morning, uh, good evening, actually. <laughs> uh, tonight, I would like to introduce a very spicy and unconventional subject, which is called the empire of 30 pieces of silver. But prior to that, I would like to um, introduce the general title, In God We Trust. I hope that uh, we will finally get that uh, image done. Uh, in God We Trust, down, down the valley here, okay. In God We Trust, it's, um, it's a statement that can be found in a many, many places of our world. And uh, at least two words attract the attention of humanity. Number one is God, and number two is trust. We're living in a society where trust is so precious. Yes? I mean, you hear that you cannot trust such banks, such bank, or such pocket. Uh, people are living in fear and anxiety. W whom should I trust? Trust is really a heavy, heavy word. Uh, I remember what uh, uh, somebody said. For 40 years, I invested in 401k or some plan. And I cannot trust anybody anymore. It was an elderly lady. And he said, but you can trust God. So when you look to this, in God we trust, we, we do have that. You know, there is a very interesting connection between money and society. And um, I would say that uh, in the Bible, these two words are found in only one place together, God and trust. Uh, if you come with me to search a little bit systematically the Bible, do you know where is the center of the Bible? Uh, the shortest chapter of the Bible is Psalm 117. This is the shortest chapter. To, do not be confused with the Bible verse. I did not say the shortest Bible verse. I said the shortest chapter of the Bible is Psalm 117. Do you know which is the longest chapter of the Bible? It's Psalm 119. Do you know where is the middle chapter of the Bible? It's Psalm 118. Is that interesting? And do you know which is the middle Bible verse of the middle chapter in the middle of the Bible? It's Psalm 118, verse 8. Uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's exactly the, the, the Bible verse from the middle of the, of, the, of, the, of the chapter. Basically, coming back a little bit, a uh, few slides, you have 594 chapters before Psalm 180, uh, 117, and you have 594 chapters after Psalm uh, 119. So exactly in the middle of the Bible, you do have exactly 1,188 chapters. And somewhere in the middle of the chapter, of the chapter that is the middle of the Bible, God set a stage for tonight's subject. Psalm 118, verse 8, concites two major words that we have said. In God, we what? We trust. Now, here is Psalm 118, uh, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put the confidence in what? In man. It's unbelievable to find out that God, in his futuristic uh, perception about the mankind's future, he set in the middle of the Bible, in the heart of the Bible, a statement that is the heart of the entire faith. It is better to trust what? To trust the Lord, to trust God, rather to put confidence in man. Uh, we are living sadly in a society where money controls society. Is that true or not? Is this a uh, 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 out, outrageous statement, and is, is this uh, uh, has some clue with the reality? Like uh, uh, with money, you can purchase army, but not necessarily a victory. Yes, with money, you can buy amusement, but not necessarily happiness. With money, you can ba buy a church, but not heaven. With money, you can buy um, a pencil, but not necessarily wisdom. With money, you can buy sex, but not love. With money, you can buy uh, whatsoever. You want a, a house, yes? With money, you can buy a house. You can purchase a house, but not necessarily a home. 
Is there any difference between a house and a home? At least in our understanding. So money directs the affairs of our society. It doesn't matter that we talk about political level or uh, of, uh, religious uh, affairs of society, a personal family, a school, education. I don't know. Is money entitled as a god in our world? But looks like money controls. For money, people are selling the mother and the father. For money, husbands divorce wives. For money, was wives divorce husbands. For, for money, brother with brother gets in argument and they don't want to see each other for years. Is that money so powerful? Is this money in control of our society, in control of our minds? And I would say yes. And he's sad to say that, that money controls conscience. For money, people betray. Do you believe so? People who made an oath, who took an oath for this country, are discovered later on. They are selling uh, super sophisticated information to who knows what country. For what? For money. And money controls society. My question is, who controls money? Who is behind money? You know, that's a very, very tricky and interesting question. Uh, we do have... Uh, that's somebody, but whosoever controls money, I would say, is not necessarily God. Do you believe so? And I give you an argument. How many believe that money is controlled by God? I don't believe so. Money, if money will be in control of God, you will not have two parts of the world starving. I'm traveling. And I, uh, I've been uh, from China to Peru. Uh, I didn't visit Africa yet. But, uh, uh, you know, when you go to visit those countries and you see, let's say, Lima, a, 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 a capital of Peru, uh, it, they, they say, I, I haven't been there for 500 years to witness that, but they say that in Lima didn't rain for 500 years. Do you know those people are eating pork fried in pork fat? Everybody dies almost at the age of 45 because they don't have water. And that's a very simplistic and destructive diet. These people have no choice. In the other side of Lima, you have the city limit of the rich people. And they have a huge 15 feet tall fence. And you need a passport. You know, you, you, are, you, you, you cross one side of the city to the other side of the city and you need a passport. Guess what? And then there is a police and control and stuff. You cannot go there because you smell. You didn't take shower. What shower if it didn't rain for, for, for 500 years? You see, and we are here wasting over 26 gallons for what? For a quick, uh, uh, you know, uh, just a, a little bit uh, of uh, uh, taking a, a, a bath or um, um, going to the bathroom to wash the hands and brush our teeth and stuff. You know, if God would be in control, the world will look different. But unfortunately, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, has made a statement that uh, I would say that penetrates every heart. Behold, the prince of this world is cometh, but in me he will not find anything. Do you remember? Jesus Christ saying that the prince of this world is cometh, but in me he will not find anything. In Matthew chapter 4, you will discover with stupefaction who controls money, who is entitled to the riches and the power of this world. Uh, Satan goes so far, and uh, if you open your Bible in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, you will discover that Satan wanted to corrupt even Jesus. He says, again, the devil taketh him up to a, an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their, the, 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 the glory of them. And, and he said, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Who says that to whom? Satan, who pretends to be in control of our glory, of our, you know, 
properties and everything, all this empire of 30 pieces of silver. He tried to tempt Jesus. If you worship me, I will give you the riches. If you worship me, I will give you all the glory of the world that you want to conquer. You know, when we come to politics and religion, become very united when it comes to the point of money. It's a, it's a very interesting historical fact. Politics and religion become very united when it comes to money. And I give you a very biblical example. Uh, how a religious uh, event becomes quickly a, a, the source of political debates. Uh, there was a time uh, Jesus has a special friendship with a family. Do you remember the family of Lazarus? How many of you remember Lazarus? Was a nice man, was a gentleman. And Jesus had a much affection for that family in Bethany. And uh, in one day he found out that Lazarus passed away, his family. He goes there to the funeral, everybody weeps, cries, so on and so forth. And Jesus performs a miracle. Wow. He resurrects Lazarus. But how can you resurrect a Lazarus? If Lazarus was a good man, he's already in heaven. What, do you, what do, you, do you have to resurrect if Lazarus, as a good man, went to straight to heaven? You see, this resurrection, this miracle that Jesus has performed to say come forth, not come down from heaven, it's a major theological debate. What's happened with the people when they pass away? But anyway, crossing the road with this theological debate, Jesus Christ amazes the world because he resurrects Lazarus. What a power. And there were people around and they start talking and the news reached the highest political and religious level of the country at that time. And look at this. When, uh, when, uh, when somebody came with the news to Caiaphas, Caiaphas, which was the highest priest in that year, he was running, running. But some of them went to their ways, uh, to the Pharisees and told them what these things Jesus had done. Hey, somebody resurrected a man. Then gathered chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we, uh, what do we uh, for this man do have many miracles? What should he do? You know, Caiaphas was a smart man. He was a very sophisticated thinker. And I'm wondering... Uh, they discuss politics and religion together. Look at this. If we let this alone, thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. Who makes this statement? Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel. Now, tell me, with your permission, two minutes open forum. This statement, it's a religious one or political one? How, what, what's your perception? Caiaphas is interested of the affairs of the nation, yes? He cares about the Romans because they were powerful and they were in control. And he cares about whom? He cares about nation. Is this a religious statement or a political statement? It's a political statement. Now, since when the priests and the Pharisees, which were entitled to take care of the humble affairs of the religion, they were politicizing the, the event. So, finally... What do they incriminate Jesus? Why do they incriminate Jesus? What did Jesus do? Oh, he performed a miracle. You know what bothered Caiaphas the most? Jesus performed a miracle for free. Well, that's a crime to make some miracles for free, not asking for money in a society where tradition costs so much. And by the way, how would you, let's say hypothetically, I know, hypothetical questions demand hypothetical answers, yes? I will address a hypothetical question. What would you do, hypothetically speaking, if you would hypothetically have the power to resurrect a man? Would you ask money for money or would you do the resurrection for free? You have, to, you have a very poor social level like Jesus, and he performed a miracle and no taxation. The gospel is for free, yes? No taxation. What would you do? Would you feel tempted when you see, man, look at this guy. He has a Corvette. 
and I have power to resurrect people, and I'm, I'm walking beside a donkey. You know, I have to raise somehow my social level. Would you be tempted to sell your power of miracles for money? Or I would, because I address that question to me too. So you see what, why Caiaphas was so, so frightened, so upset. Jesus makes miracles and he didn't charge money. I mean, this is not in fashion. This is not, uh, it's something very, very dangerous. Um, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, ye know nothing at all. Well, how do you translate that for 21st century civilized human beings like us? This statement, ye know nothing. You don't know anything about politics. Caiaphas says, hey, you guys, you're little babies. I know the politics. I can fix this issue. I can eliminate Jesus. I will erase him from the history of humanity. You will never hear about this guy. He's too dangerous. Why, Caiaphas, is Jesus dangerous? Well... He tried to change the order of things. What? Yes, he promised us a better world. So it's dangerous. It's a threat for our nation and for the Romans. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man shall die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Question number two. When Caiaphas makes this statement, okay, we plot, we decide to kill Jesus to save a nation. Is this a moral statement? How much morality do you see in this statement? Okay, when you get to this point, you can translate this uh, John 3.16, th uh, yes? Re uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, you know, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever delivered in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's God, because he loves us. But Caiaphas, Caiaphas, the high priest, he loved himself. How much morality do you find in this statement, my friend? It is in our advantage to kill Jesus, to save the Jewish nation. And I want to ask you something. Knowing the history after the crucifixion of Jesus, by crucifying Jesus, by plotting the, uh, to, 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 to kill the Lord Jesus Christ, did Caiaphas save the nation or curse the nation? Cur well, he had the impression a political maneuver will save the nation. Political maneuvers will not save any nation in the world, but a, a right spirit and principles. Now, here is another point challenging. Election time. In Palestine, they had election time. And Pilate was uh, the governor of Rome, uh, was in control. They had two candidates, Jesus and whom? Barabbas. Uh, agenda, both promised a better world. Both of them promised a better world. Uh, there are history, I mean, Jesus promised a better world in his terms, yes? When, um, when um, you know, uh, when you looked at the disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus was saying, look, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent, and so on and so forth. John the Baptist was around. So the disciples were thinking, wow, the kingdom of God is at hand. Ah, oh, this Jesus will use his power to finish the Roman Empire. He will kill everybody and will make us the kingdom of the world. But Jesus was talking about a better world in his terms. And, and Barabbas was promising a better world. Uh, how many of you know why did Barabbas end up to the position of being crucified? Why? He initiated a revolution against the Roman Empire. He promoted the um, aggressiveness and deliverance by the power of the muscles. He killed a lot of Romans, so on and so forth. Finally, he got caught. But he was promising deliverance and a better world, and we will be the supreme empire of the world. Barabbas was promising that to the people. Now, society, society, the priests, and the elders of Israel had a dilemma. Whom should we elect? Jesus promised a better world. Barabbas is promising a better world. 
whom we gonna choose? And one question is, my friends, Barabbas, uh, uh, Jesus had a problem. He was too friendly with the Romans. Caiaphas was saying, hmm, huh? Yeah, Jesus is a good man, but he shows too much love and tenderness to the Romans, which are our enemies, our national enemies. Barabbas, he's more efficient. He kills Romans. I think that Barabbas fits much more to our national expectations rather than Jesus. Jesus is too platonic, too platonic for our liking. And in the end, they decided to sacrifice the aspirations, the promises of Jesus Christ for something that was so earthly and so, uh, so I would say, down to the earth. Human beings, through the power of the muscles, try to erect an empire. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Well, to have a clear election in, in Palestine 2,000 years ago, they have to throw and to decide. And they decided, the priests and the elders persuaded whom? The voting machine, yes? When you say multitude in the Bible, meaning a, a, a voting machine, which is me and you, all together, they, they persuaded. Well, when you talk about persuasion, there are many ways of persuading people to vote in one way or in the other way. My friends, do you say in the Bible, I don't invent things. You know, sometimes I'm thinking, why should I preach things like this? Because this is 2,000 years ago. This is not now. But the more I read the Bible, you know, which is my personal conclusion, the more I read the Bible, the more I understand that the, there is so much similarity between the priests of that time and the priests of this time, between the, uh, the politicians of that time and the politicians of this time, between the elders or the wise men of tho those times and the wise men of these times. It's the same movie. You know what is different? The actors. The actors are different, but it's the same movie, my friends. And, and this is interesting how the persuasion, and here comes money. I promise you a better world. I vote for me, this vote for me, that. And um, in the end, in the end, they released Barabbas. And I have a question at the final of our evening. Um, Edmund Burke made a, a powerful statement in history. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Is that true? When Jesus was there with Barabbas, what did good men do? They ran away. All his disciples did not open their mouth. They were afraid and they ran away. They didn't take a stand for what is right. And this is the price that we pay every generation in any society, in any country in the world, when an evil is going on and we do not have moral power to stand, we pay this price. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. I remember about the uh, statement, which is a generic of, a generic of, our, um, of uh, our cycle, um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. At the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. Do you agree with that? All that it takes for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Where did Barabbas go, my friends? I, I don't know exactly if you ever, ever thought, okay, Pilate releases Barabbas. You are free men. When Pilate tells you that you're a free man, you can run a horse, you can go in a bar and drink uh, vodka, you can do whatever you want. It's your life. You are free, Barabbas. And I was thinking for myself, because the Bible doesn't write, and I never found any historical statement. What do you know? Have you ever heard, what did Barabbas do after he was released? I mean, it's an interesting topic. It's not in the Bible, but it's a phenomenon because he didn't die immediately when uh, he, he, he was released. I mean, did he leave? Did he stay amongst the multitude, the crowd? Was Barabbas looking and gazing to Jesus? 
Did he cry, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him? What did Barabbas do with his freedom in the following five minutes? It's a great mystery. I don't know. But that I was just thinking to sit beside Jesus and to know that you are alive and you are free because he is in bandage. He is condemned to crucifixion. Man, that's tough. To stay myself, leave you, to stay beside Jesus and to do things like Barabbas did, kill people and lie and steal and do things. And all of a sudden, everybody, based on the law, ha has to condemn me. And Jesus is beside me. And I'm released. And an innocent man like Jesus is condemned to a punishment that he doesn't deserve. I will be in the multitude and I will think. You know, in the history and the story with Barabbas is a lesson. Me and you, we all are Barabbas. Jesus was beside us when we deserve condemnation. But he says, you know what? You are not ready to die. You are free. Was a higher power that was releasing Barabbas. I don't know if Barabbas did know what to do with that portion of life of his freedom. But I felt many times in life like being a Barabbas. How about you? I felt that I have this life because he was being crucified. We are Barabbas. We are free human beings delivered by Jesus in a judgment hall uh, based on unjust decision. What are we going to do tonight with our Barabbas? And I end with a story. There was a, a blind man and uh, he was uh, visited by a lady. He was born bla blind and um, the parable says that he says, look, I don't know how you look like, but your tenderness, your love, your compassion, if I would see, if I would have eyes, I would marry you. And one day the lady says, you know what? Here is a price. We found a doctor that can give you uh, an implant. It's a new formula. Something happens and you will get your eyes. Say, wow, that will be fantastic. If I will see, I will marry you. So the doctor performs the, uh, the uh, implant of his own eye, uh, eyes, removes the natural ones, put two. It works according to the, the, the parable. And then he sees. And when he opens his eyes, discovers that the lady that is beside him is blind too. And she's asking him, are you really still marrying me? And he says, well, when I said that I will marry you, I wasn't, I didn't know that you are blind too. So I don't think that I will go ahead perform this, I mean, to fulfill my, my commitment. I, I didn't know that you are blind, I'm sorry. I, I, I cannot marry you. And the woman replies, yes, because the eyes that you have today were mine. At the time when you promised me that you will marry me, you were blind and I could see. And because I love you, I pull up my eyes and I give it to you to see the one that was so tender and so lovely to you. Would you marry me? Brothers and sisters and friends and uh, visitors, many times we do this game with Jesus. When we are in trouble, we promise, Lord Jesus, if you will be, will save me, will take me out of this trouble, I promise you full obedience. I will love you. I will follow you. I will make you my Lord and so on and so forth. And as soon as we get out of trouble, we forget. We are living in a time of decision. This world does not necessarily belong to me and to you. It's a world of an empire of blood. Judas, who betrayed Jesus Christ, basically did not gain much happiness out of those 30 pieces of silver, did he? How, how much did he spend from those 30 pieces of silver? 
when he shed innocent blood. You know, it's unbelievable to see how our world, every time a crime is committed, an innocent blood is shed, a, a, a price of our planet, uh, a piece of our planet is purchased with a price. Still, there is no more land to buy, no more blood to shed. This is the empire of 30 pieces of silver. An empire of, um, Benjamin Franklin said that starvation needs something. Um, he says uh, apathy needs something more, and avarice, avarice needs everything. They never, they never say you know, uh, it's enough. There are people in this planet that build this empire every day by sh uh, by by spilling down the ground innocent blood. This is the empire of 30 pieces of silver, and I don't feel comfortable to stay on this planet like that. And uh, when you look to this, uh, I don't know exactly if you heard about uh, Burji Ar Arab. Have you ever heard about a hotel seven stars? It's uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the cheapest room is $2,500 per night. Uh, this is the hotel, it's an island, artificial island. It's a hotel, I think has 800 meters, the, 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 the height. Um, and uh, it's interesting uh, to see how much waste has been invested. 250 designers, 9,000 tons of steel, 43,000 square meters of glass, 13,000 square meters of Carrara marble, 12,000 square meters of Brazilian granite, 32,000 square meters of Italian mosaic, uh, 1,500 square meters of Penny Fork, Arab gold leaf, 1,200 colleagues, quote unquote, slave to bring you in. When you go to Burji Ar Arab, they, they, they have an elevator in which they can bring your car. The, 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 building is, the building is rotating 24 hours. So it doesn't matter where your, up, your room is. And by the way, your room is an apartment of all close to 7,000 square feet. That's a $2,500 per night. How luxuriously some people in this world live and look in the other side of the world where people are starving. I was so impressed when I saw yesterday a picture from Africa where a, a, a man, an African-American gentleman in that country uh, uh, manufactured from two bottles of plastic um, sleepers for him, uh, a, a pair of shoes. It was unbelievable. With a uh, with few ropes, he tightened the, 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 the exit of that bottle and, and he, he, he tried to surround his leg there and he, with two bowls, kind of a quench there, he created a form or design or shape of a shoe. I was so impressed. And when you look, the discrepancy is too big to make any further comment. We're living in an empire of 30 pieces of silver, where the rich becomes richer and the poor becomes poorer. My friends, this world is not yours. If you really believe in a better world, take the advantage of Jesus and see with his eyes how much God loves you and how much God loves me. The empire of Jesus Christ is not built on force. Napoleon, prior his departure from this world, he says, I, Charlemagne, Constantine the Great, and many others have established an empire by force. But Jesus, this Jesus, Napoleon says, has established his empire by love. And today, millions are ready to die for his name, Jesus. And he, with a uh, uh, skepticism in his voice. If I will call today thousand soldiers from France to die for Napoleon, how many will be ready to die for me? No one. But if you call the name of Jesus today in France, millions are ready to die for his name. Welcome in a world of reality. This is not a world that will belong to you and to me for a longer time. Jesus Christ is coming soon. And I would rush as a Baraba, converted or unconverted, repented or unrepented, to embrace the holy feet of Jesus that brought so much peace in my life. And this is my wish and prayer for tonight. Amen. Uh, I would like to invite you to stand, if your heart feels so, to have a moment of prayer and to talk to Jesus about our burden and our, about our needs. So. Let's rise a little bit for a moment of prayer. Thank you very much. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
seeing a scary reality. How poverty and how poorness and tragedy follow, follows us every day in the world. We are so insecure. And on the holy pages of the Bible, we discover the unique and unreplaceable name of Jesus. And as we see ourselves released in the time of judgment as Barabbas, men and women, we feel free to choose for our life. We crossed and passed many troubles. And tonight, tired of running away from threat and jeopardy, tired of finding solution for our hearts, we come to you and we come to Jesus. And we are looking to the, the blood of the Son of God that was shed for our sins. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to receive our nothingness, our lowliness, to receive our inner cry, our inner prayer that cannot find appropriate human language to define pain and guilt and process of conscience. As we are departing tonight from this place, I would pray, Heavenly Father, to follow, protect, and impress the hearts of the people who made a tremendous sacrifice to come here tonight. They could have been in so many other places, but I have chosen to be here beside I work. They may have problems in their lives. They may have problems in their family, in their relationship with their spouses, with their parents, with their children, with their friends. Lord, find wisdom and let the Holy Spirit touch tenderly their heart, telling them how much you love them. And if thy grace will be done, let tomorrow evening be another night where we will continue our journey from the earth to the kingdom of God on the footprint of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you very much, my dear friends. One minute until my co-worker will make a final announcement. And from my side, I wish uh, to have a blessed night, hoping that tomorrow evening you will come to continue our journey in the prophecy, American dream, but not only, and um, um, endless, uh, ageless living. Uh, Dr. John Baer will continue his session of health um, seminar. I would invite uh, Mr. Boris to give us a farewell tonight, and I wish you a blessed evening.